A listener's note. The following episode contains coarse language, adult themes, and content of a violent and disturbing nature, and may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. May 4th, 2013 was a beautiful sunny spring day in Calgary. The warm weather meant people were finally spending time outside. In one new suburb, neighbors got together for a barbecue and drinks. It was a memorable night filled with good conversation and laughter. There's a lasting reminder of that evening. A photo of two men looking straight to the camera, smiling, having a great time. But just minutes after that photo was taken... Another one for what city? Hello? Hey, in the ambulance. It's right now. Okay, are you calling from Calgary? Yes. There's a guy stabbed multiple times. It's a brand new neighborhood in the suburbs of Calgary where grass hasn't even been planted yet. The sidewalk is now stained with blood in front of a home marked as a potential crime scene. There was no indication at all from them that this was going to be the end result. I'm Nancy Hickst, a crime reporter for Global News. Today on Crime Beat, a case that will leave you questioning what horrors you can encounter just two doors down. This is the story of Mr. Kellaway. This story began almost 50 years ago in Glace Bay on Cape Breton Island on the eastern edge of Nova Scotia. Harvey and Monica Calloway met when Monica was a clerk at a town hall and Harvey was a police officer. They worked in the same building, but a chance encounter at a wedding gave him the opportunity to ask her out. And the rest, as they say, is history. They got married in May of 1973 and soon after tried to start a family. After eight years, they were pretty much resigned that it wasn't meant to be until... I wasn't feeling good, and then uh, I didn't think anything more of it. I thought the flu was on the go. It was in the fall, and I went to see my doctor, and he sent me for the test and everything, and he said, you're three months pregnant. (laughs) They soon met the miracle child they'd always hoped for. Craig was born Thursday night, May 28th at 9.43 in the night. He was eight pounds, 21 inches long, and he was my baby. He was the type of baby that he wanted to be on the move, and it didn't matter what time of the night you put him down for sleep. It could be 10 o'clock. It could be 8 o'clock. He woke up at 5 or 6 on the dot every morning. It was unbelievable. But he he wanted to be into everything. He had to, he would go after the TV and change the colors on the TV. Oh, he, he was something else. Before long, Monica was pregnant again. And just over a year later, Craig became a big brother. Soon the two boys were playing hockey every chance they got. There's a path in the woods and I take a shovel, and although a lot of spaces, the ice was clear, and that's where he learned how to skate. And then just the hockey stick, and that was it. He loved it. Hockey was a lifelong passion of Craig's, but after university, he found his true calling in teaching. For about a year, he worked as a substitute teacher in his hometown then surprised his family with news that he was headed west. Craig was the type of person, he was a homebody. He liked being home. He liked Cape Breton, he liked Glace Bay. You know, his buddies were here and everything, his friends, but it it was a shock to, to see that he had gone. The move was a huge stepping stone for his career, and it wasn't long before he was teaching full-time at David Thompson Middle School. He got along with them so well, like, and 
being a Cape Bretoner, he, when he went there, he would stop at Tim Hortons before going to the school and he'd have coffee in them for, for them. Craig, or Mr. Kellaway, became a role model for his students. So he was a science teacher. He sometimes he dabbled in math. Occasionally he subbed in English, but he was bad at it. <laughs> um, uh, he was always a gym teacher as well, sometimes substituting on that. He was really all around. Jackson Hector first met Mr. Kellaway when he was 10 years old. He was trustworthy, he was kind, and it was, it was kind of like another father figure to me because, you know, the countless advice and hours he put into us as students and there are, there are testimonies and countless hours I can only imagine that other students had with him and interacted and they, we wouldn't trade it for the world because it made us who we, are, who we are today, for sure. Jackson's family had just moved to Calgary from the UK. He was struggling with the transition, ended up in a bit of trouble and got suspended. When he returned to school, Mr. Kellaway was there to help set him on the right path. And for me, it was heartfelt, tears everywhere, because I was just, it was kind of like someone finally cared enough to tell me. Not saying that my parents were not there, they definitely were, but it was just, you know, having that outlet of someone on the outside looking in to be like, hey, like, I understand your situation, I know where you've come from, I know it's rough for you, and I know things may seem tough, but, you know, don't give up. The staff and students, including Jackson, at David Thompson Middle School, became Mr. Kellaway's extended family. Whether it was organizing floor hockey games or helping a student get extra tutoring on a weekend, Mr. Kellaway was always there. After a series of unsuccessful romantic relationships, Craig put down roots in Calgary. And in December of 2012, he had a son named Blake. <laughs> He was proud. He had that smile on his face, you know? He just had to see him. Very attentive father he was to him. And he used to say to me, I can't wait till he gets older because I can teach him how to skate and play hockey. And I said, Craig, don't wish your life away. I said, the time will come. No one knew the turn Craig's life was about to take. By 2013, Craig was building a happy life in Calgary. Even though the relationship with the mother of his child didn't last, he loved spending time with Blake, who by then was five months old. And he made sure his family, who was across the country in Glace Bay, always felt included in his life. Craig called us three times a day. You can go by the clock. If it was 9.30, soon as you saw 9.30 here, you know that that's Craig. It's 6.30, he's on his way out the door to go to school. And then at 6.30 in the evening, the phone would ring, it was Craig. He's on his way home from school. And then he'd say, I'm... Psst. I'm home now, I'll give you a call after I have supper. And then about nine o'clock our time, then we get a call from him again. Majority of the times, three times a day. That spring, Craig was just settling into life in a new Calgary suburb. It was a brand new community on the southeastern edge of the city. It was so new, most of the homes didn't even have grass planted or fences built. When the started to dig the basement out and put the concrete in, uh, he sent every picture, every stage of that house being built. On Saturday, May 4th, he met a couple who was also new to the neighborhood and invited them over for a barbecue. We FaceTimed with each other that, that afternoon. And, uh, and I looked and I said, oh, you got Caper. Caper is his dog. And he was up on the, on the Chesterfield looking out the window and we were talking about different things and that. And he said he was having a barbecue that evening and having a couple of friends over. Craig told his parents he was going to spend a few hours with Blake, then take him back to his ex's place. He returned home to his girlfriend to get things ready for the barbecue with the new neighbors. 
Then he said, uh, I got to go. He said, I got to go change Blake's pamper. I said, okay. So uh, Harvey said to him, he said, Craig, call us around nine o'clock tonight, which would be six o'clock Calgary time. Monica ended the call the same way she always did. I said, take care, love you. Later that night, Monica and Harvey waited to hear from their son. Hours went by, and there was no word from Craig. Not a thing to worry about. No, just another Cape Breton barbecue. We figured, oh, he's just enjoying his company, and we'll hear from him tomorrow morning. Because usually, if he did have a barbecue with some friends over, that's what he did. He wouldn't call that night, and then the next morning, he would call, and he'd say, I never got back to you because because of uh, having guests over, you know. What happened next still haunts her. Yeah, I never thought that I'd be going through what happened the next day. Hmm, seven o'clock the next morning, Harvey was, uh, Harvey's always up early. And uh, he hollered to me. He said, Monica, stay in bed. I said, why? He said, the police are here. Two cop cars. And another cu- a couple of cars. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, just stay there. He said, I'll handle it. So I thought, oh, God. I better get up. Monica said when she went into her dining room, police were there. So was her cousin. And I said, what's going on? She said, it's Craig. He's gone. I said, no, he's not gone. She said, Monica, he's gone. And I said, no, they can fix him. I figured he was in a car accident. And then I said, they can fix him up, can't they? And she said, no. She said, Monica, he's gone. At that time, police in Glace Bay could only tell Monica and Harvey that their son was dead. It seemed like it was a blur, like I couldn't, I couldn't get it out of my head. I just couldn't, I couldn't accept that he was gone. How did a friendly barbecue between new neighbors turn deadly? Here's the panicked call made to 911 early in the morning of May 5th, 2013. 911 for what city? Hello? Hey, I'm in the ambulance right now. Okay, are you calling from Calgary? Yes. Okay, tell me your address again for verification, please. What the caller said next shocked police. There's a guy stabbed multiple times by me. Oh my God. Police and EMS were dispatched. They found a man gasping for breath on the living room floor. A second man was sitting at the kitchen counter. The injured man died in the ambulance before he could be rushed to hospital. He was later identified as Craig Kellaway. Meanwhile, veteran Calgary Police Detective Russ Williamson got a call in the middle of the night from his staff sergeant. Williamson, along with a team of detectives, met at police headquarters and listened to the 911 call. Sir, when did this happen? Just like five minutes ago. Okay. Jesus Christ. Okay. Is there any serious bleeding? Yeah, all over everywhere. I stabbed him everywhere. (laughs) Okay, sir. Is there more than one wound? Yeah, I can stab him multiple times. I've been involved in multiple homicide investigations, and at no point have I uh, can I recall that uh, an offender or an accuser, somebody responsible for the death of another person, actually called police to report it, right? Um, so yeah, that was kind of a first for me, for sure. Williamson was assigned as the primary investigator. We were trying to piece together, okay, was this in self-defense? Uh, Is this a legitimate thing that had happened? Was there something that criminal had happened? We keep a very objective mind about it and we start collecting evidence. When I pulled up, there was a, um, the ambulance was out front and there was Mr. Callaway that was inside the ambulance at the time. I went into the crime scene and uh, was brought in and shown uh, 
what had happened. So right away you could see that there was a large amount of blood that was all over the floor inside the living room. It was a very gruesome scene. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been to a number of homicide scenes. This is definitely uh, a gruesome one for sure. I actually went to the autopsy on this uh, particular file. So I went down there and that's when we truly learned the extent of the injuries. There was literally blood all over him. So they had to clean that blood up so that we could actually see where some of the injuries were. After they did that, we noticed that there was uh, a significant amount of uh, defensive injuries that were on his arms, on the victim's arms, as well as on his hands. And if I'm not mistaken, one of his thumbs received quite a severe cut where it was almost uh, cut off. A forensic examination of the crime scene revealed three knives were used to kill Craig Calloway. Speaking to the brutality of what had actually occurred, um, two of the knives were broken. Now, when I'm talking about knives, I want you to go to, everybody has, like most people have, a nice big butcher block of knives in their kitchen. Take the three biggest knives you have. Like the three biggest, um, there's one that's super long, that one was used. There was uh, the other two that are more thicker type of knives, um, almost uh, butcher type knives. Those were both used, so very large knives. Those two thick ones were both broken. One blade, I think it was about a four to six inch piece of it was located in Mr. Kelloway's back. The other one, the blade was uh, located on the floor by the fire mantle where Mr. Kelloway was found. And the last one was located on the kitchen, kitchen counter and it was bent, like, and that was the long one. It was bent quite a bit, almost at a 45 degree angle. And there was about a one inch chunk off that blade that was, that was broken off of it. And that was located inside Mr. Kellaway as well. The man who made the 911 call turned out to be Craig Kellaway's new neighbor. They lived just two doors apart. His name, Nicholas Raspberry. Raspberry's house was sealed off as a crime scene, and he was taken into custody. Then, just two days later, he was charged, accused of the second-degree murder of Craig Kellaway. There was no question that he was responsible for the death. The question was, what happened? Nicholas Raspberry was a 25-year-old professional engineer. He had worked overseas for a period of time. Um, my impression of him was, was he was kind of an up-and-comer. Both Craig's girlfriend and Raspberry's wife told police the night had been fun. Drinks and laughs, good times between new neighbors. That they were jovial, they were getting along, they were watching hockey, uh, they were talking about just different things. And um, yeah, there was no indication at all from them that this was going to be the end result. A photo taken at about 10.30 that night was further evidence that it appeared to be a good time. It's a picture of uh, Mr. Kellaway and Mr. Raspberry, and they've got their arms around each other and they're each holding alcoholic beverages and they look like uh, just a couple of guys having a good time. How did things turn so badly, so quickly? The call to 911 was made less than an hour later. Stark contrast to a few minutes later, yeah. Yeah, it certainly causes a lot of questions, right, as to how would that happen, why would that happen, and uh, in the end result, like the nature of the injuries, what went into all of that? How did that all transpire within 20 minutes, right? Craig's parents felt helpless. They were 5,000 kilometers away when Calgary Police homicide investigators told them their son was stabbed 37 times. Oh my God, that's horrific. I couldn't believe it. I said, to, I said to Harv, that's pure rage for a person to do that to another human being. That's beyond. And I said, Craig didn't deserve that. Nicholas Raspberry spent just over a year in custody while awaiting trial before being granted bail. He remained out on bail throughout the second-degree murder trial. Craig's family watched the court proceedings unfold from afar. I should note, I've talked to Monica dozens of times over the years, but I've never actually met her in person. We did this interview via FaceTime 
from her home in Glace Bay. The Callaways said traveling to Calgary for the trial was just too much. I wanted to go, but the two doctors that I'm seeing, they advised against it. They said, no, don't go out there. Don't, because you're only going to make it worse on yourself. So I had to go by the doctor's decision, and I wouldn't have been up for it. The trial began on October 5th, 2015, nearly a year and a half after Craig Kellaway was killed. Good evening, an emotional day in a Calgary court as the trial of a man accused of killing a Calgary teacher got underway. The accused is Nicholas Raspberry. He's charged with second degree murder. Today he entered a plea of not guilty. The men and their significant others had drinks, a barbecue at the victim's house and capped off the night with more drinking at the Raspberry home. When Raspberry's wife went to bed and Kellaway's girlfriend went home, something went wrong that led to Kellaway's death. Hours after Raspberry was arrested, he was interviewed by police. A video of that interview was played in court. I'll share parts of it in this episode. The audio is muffled at times, so you need to listen carefully. So I was just home doing stuff, like around the house, and I was up on the deck, and um, so we had neighbors, like, two doors down, they were in the backyard. Raspberry told the detective about the barbecue at Craig Kellaway's home and how later that night they moved the party to his house. The girlfriend once again took the dog and said she was going home. So it was the three of us, my wife there as well. And then um, my wife went up to bed and we continued, we, we stayed downstairs. And, um, and then at some point I just felt like the night was drawing to a close and I'm not sure if I said I was going to go to bed or if I said I had to take the dogs out to pee, but I kind of remember just kind of making it clear that, like, the night was kind of over. Raspberry said that's when the mood changed. I was drunk, having fun, and then all of a sudden I was sober, and he had me by the throat with my shirt twisted up and up against my counter and trying to, like, had had his one hand, like, always by my face threatening to punch me and telling me to stop moving and to, and to like, let him have sex with me. And he was like, I'm going to, if you don't, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. And, you know, I was, at that point, I was, like, I was surprised. I'm not a small guy, but he was manhandling me. And uh, I was ready to just start swinging. And then he was, started, said, your wife's upstairs, she's next. He said, that's when he grabbed a knife. I should note, the trial judge found the two men were both athletically fit and close in height and weight. I remember the moment in stabbing, and I remember being like, at this point, like, there's no turning back. Like, if if he, if if he doesn't go to the ground, he's gonna, he's gonna, you know, kill me and maybe my wife. I think at one point, either the knife fell or broke or something. And I remember, I think I grabbed another one. I was pushing him away, and we we made our way into the into the, like our our kitchen is connected to our living room. We made our way to the living room. He fell, and it was like it was over. He fell. I was done. All I remember is putting the knife back on the counter, grabbing my phone, and calling nine one one. And here's Detective Williamson. There was no evidence at all of, that a sexual assault had occurred. There was no evidence in the autopsy that there was a sexual assault. Uh, Mr. Calloway or Mr. Raspberry himself uh, said that there was, it was just the threat. He did not allege that he was raped. He didn't allege that Mr. Calloway hit him. He alleged that Mr. Calloway grabbed him by the scruff, pushed him up against the uh, kitchen counter and threatened to rape him. That was the extent of what he said Mr. Calloway did. Like, could I grab, like, the coffee maker, sir? Could I grab the coffee pot? We have a toaster. Like, what could I have done differently? At one point, Raspberry drew a picture, a diagram of how he said the fatal night played out. I grabbed the knife, and then at that, that point, it's like, it, like, I honestly felt like it was him or me, you know? If my wife wasn't there and this was at, like, his house, you know, like, I would have taken my chances, you know? I really would have. Like, I was ready. Like, I was turning, and he was, like, threatening to hit me, and, like, I was still screaming my wife's name. 
You know, like I wasn't, I was not laying down. I was not, you know, I was, I was gonna do everything I could to squirm free and. What I would have expected is that there would be some defensive injuries on Mr. Raspberry as well. That would explain this amount of uh, force that was used. So, uh, you know, maybe some bruising, um, some scrapes, something like a scuffle or a wrestling match or anything along those lines that would help his story, right? Um, because my job, like I said, is to determine the truth. So I'm keeping an open mind. Is his story legitimate or are these other facts that are pointing in another direction? Do they need to be explored more, right? So we take everything into totality of it. Uh, one thing that struck me as very odd was there was not a single injury on Mr. Raspberry whatsoever. The detective doing the interview with Raspberry pressed him on this issue. I'll be honest with you, because you've been honest with me. Um, I think you're leaving a portion out. I think you're leaving out what started, what started it. it. And, and that's where I guess I'm having some confusion. Yeah. Um, because I would say that that would not be normal behavior, to mm -hmm. go from talking about hockey, talking about stuff, yeah. to this. Yeah. There should like there's something in the middle. I know. Like were you guys having a conversation about about sex or sexual practices or? No, like I don't remember talking about or, any. Don't remember talking about any sex. Whether you instigated something or he instigated something, I'm worried that there's an embarrassment factor for yeah, you here. And, and I'm, it's not like like it switched. It was like a, and, and it was like a sobering moment. Like just I'm in a horrible situation and I'm not sure what I'm going to do to get out of it. The interview went on for more than two hours. At one point, the detective offered Raspberry another plausible explanation, one that said it was actually him that came on to Craig Kellaway. And I should warn you, the following excerpt of the police interview is extremely graphic. He, so he, you're doing the holy shit, and he's going to beat the shit out of you because you just made a move on him, and you, you took the, you did the... You, you took a step because you've been drinking to take that move, to make that move, and it was a mistake, and he reacted, and he's going to beat the shit out of you, and you get scared, or you and you see red. At the moment, you're, you're protecting yourself by making him the aggressor in this, when clearly the scene is going to tell us that you're the aggressor. Like, you've stabbed this guy a lot of times, and really scared. Like, you've eviscerated him. His bowels are hanging out. Like that's it. Like that's huge. It. Those are huge injuries. Mm -hmm. And I mean, are we gonna find when we go back in that house that you stabbed him in that living room when he's on his back? But but he didn't do anything to you other than hold you by the shirt. What did he do? Trying to have sex with me, threatened to punch me, threatened to but, punch my wife. But how? So he so but he, how did he? He doesn't try to have sex with you, right? You say he doesn't undo his pants. He doesn't undo your pants. He's not grabbing you, he's not doing anything, he's holding you in yet. a hockey, and hockey the, jersey. Yet. So, we don't know what's gonna happen. I know, and that's where I had to, I, and that's where I trust myself and I trust the person I am. And in that situation, I felt like I did what I had to do because I knew what was gonna happen. And it's, it's horrible to say, but, you know, better him than me and my wife. The medical examiner provided extensive evidence during the trial. Two of the wounds to Craig's jugular and thoracic aorta could have caused enough blood loss on their own to lead to death. There were also multiple injuries to his lungs and diaphragm, which would have made breathing difficult. Craig's left hand and arm showed signs of defensive wounds and were so badly injured they were unusable court also heard at least one serious stab wound occurred after his heart was no longer pumping blood through his body in any meaningful manner. Was this second-degree murder, or was this self-defense? Would it be reasonable if somebody did that to you, grabbed you by the scruff of your neck, threw you up against a counter, and threatened to rape you? Would it be reasonable that you can defend yourself? Absolutely. No doubt about it. Okay, but there is a, a point where it goes over the line. And that was my concern is I definitely couldn't prove that that was said or done. Couldn't prove or disprove either way, right? But what I had a big concern with is, okay, there's some defensive injuries on the front. Well, maybe that took place in the very front start of it, okay? 
My big concern is 32 stab and slash wounds in the back. To me, and from what I observed from the evidence, I interpreted that as Mr. Kellaway was no longer, if he was the bad guy to start with, he was no longer in that capacity. He potentially turned from um, being a bad guy into being um, a prey, being this other individual, pursuing him, and um, now he's the victim. After nearly a month-long trial, the judge handed down his decision in the case. Outrage tonight from the mother of a Calgary teacher stabbed to death by his brand new neighbor. A judge found Nicholas Raspberry guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. Nancy Hicks reports. I cried. I really, I broke down and I cried and I thought, this didn't help Craig. Monica Kellaway is devastated. First, she lost her son, Craig. He was stabbed 37 times. Now the man accused of killing him has been found guilty of the lesser offense of manslaughter. And he got away with murder. It's unreal. I'm sorry, but that man, he, he, just, he just took our life away. In convicting Raspberry of the lesser charge of manslaughter, the trial judge expressed some skepticism about Raspberry's account of events, but was still left with reasonable doubt. He ultimately found that Raspberry believed he faced a threat of grievous bodily harm and that he was entitled to respond with force to defend himself and his wife. However, the judge also found the force used went beyond what was necessary for self-defense. This family's really been victimized on a number of different levels. Uh, definitely one of the strategies from the defense was uh, that Mr. Kellaway uh, was the perpetrator, was the one that started all this, was the one that um, um, was going to rape Mr. Raspberry. Um, so the defense really pushed that theory forward in court um, without Mr. Kellaway ever being able to defend himself, right? So he has no say, but the defense had that say and really pushed it, right? Um, really used some offensive, in, in my, I was offended for the victim's family being there, hearing some of the things that were alleged about him with no proof whatsoever that this was legitimate or not. I really thought the justice, justice would be served and he would be found guilty of second degree murder and he would be sent away for 25 years. But his sentence wouldn't come close to that. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. The man convicted of manslaughter and the death of a Calgary teacher learned his fate today. Craig Kellaway was killed in May of 2013, and now his neighbor, Nicholas Raspberry, is going to jail. Nancy Hicks joins us from the court centre with the latest on this. Nancy. Today, Nicholas Raspberry was sentenced to seven years in prison for the death of Calgary teacher Craig Kellaway. With one and a half credit for time already served, he has five years and four months left in his sentence. Raspberry went into custody in December of 2015, but he would spend very little time behind bars. Just two months into his seven-year sentence, Raspberry was again freed on bail, this time pending the appeal of his manslaughter conviction. Then... Five years after he killed Craig Kellaway, the Alberta Court of Appeal upheld the manslaughter conviction. The Supreme Court of Canada declined to hear the case. Just before the fifth anniversary of Craig's death, in March of 2018, Raspberry was ordered to turn himself in. After credit for time served, he had just over five years left in his sentence. Two years after that, in June of 2020, Raspberry applied for parole. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the hearing was held virtually. Craig's mom attended from her home in Glace Bay, while I attended from Calgary. You were there with me. Yep. That was a pile of BS. In my opinion, that's what it was. I was wishing I could have been there to face him. Monica read a tear-filled victim impact statement 
to try to help the board see what she feels Raspberry has done to her family. I wanted them to know what kind of a person they were dealing with, that he is a narcissistic person, he believes his own lies, and he will not take the blame for anything that he does. He blames everybody else. Raspberry told the board he doesn't want to be defined by what happened that night. He said, It was a terrible night, and I truly am sorry. But Monica Kellaway rejects that apology. B.S. He's not remorseful. He has no remorse in him. That's his way of trying to show the parole members I'm trying, and I can, if I can do say these things, then uh, I'm making myself look good, and they'll give me parole. Craig Kellaway's former student, Jackson Hector, wrote a letter to the parole board in hopes of explaining the far-reaching impacts of Raspberry's actions. I wanted to show him that with his courage, consistent lessons, and unrelenting love he installed in me, I made it. I didn't fail one class. I passed all my exams with flying colors, but he never got to see me hold that paper in front of him. I hope he knows that I wouldn't have made it without him. I hope he knows I loved him like a dad. I hope he knows that I speak for a lot of my fellow students back then and the friends I have still to this day from David Thompson. We miss you, Mr. Calloway, and we always will. The parole board also heard Raspberry fainted in prison about a month before his hearing. He claimed to be having trouble sleeping when he took a pill from a fellow inmate known as a dream eater. He told the board he made a mistake. A 2019 psychological risk assessment noted Raspberry minimized and had limited insight into the seriousness of his offense. The board noted he's been assessed as a low risk to re-offend. However, his case management team pointed out that it's difficult to truly assess his risk because his offending was so uncharacteristic and he struggled with insights as to why and how it occurred. The board denied full parole, but stated it satisfied Raspberry's risk can be manageable on day parole in a halfway house. His day parole is granted for six months, and he has no restrictions on overnight leave privileges. He has four conditions to follow, including no alcohol or drugs, to continue with counseling, to report all intimate sexual and non-sexual relationships with males and females, and to have no contact with the victim's family. For this episode, I reached out to Raspberry through the Correctional Service of Canada. Originally, I was told he'd think about it, but his lawyer later contacted me to decline. He's a good actor, and he, he's, got, he's got his story, and he's not going to change it. He doesn't care about my son. He cares about his own life. Years later... This case continues to haunt Detective Williamson. So is it one of those cases that just will always bug you? Oh, for sure it will. Yeah, it it absolutely will. Just knowing that piece as to to what had happened within those last few moments of those individuals from the time that that picture was taken and 20 minutes later when Mr. Kellaway was dead. What turned from two guys hanging out, looking like they're having fun and they're drinking buddies, to one of them ending up dead with 37 stab wounds, 32 being in the back. But this is definitely one that still a lot of investigators uh, still shake their head at and what the heck happened. For Monica, time isn't lessening the grief. Instead, it consumes her. Not a day goes by. And that's what I see. I see what happened to Craig. And it plays out every day. It's uh, first panic attacks. I don't know when they're going to hit me. I've been to places uh, going to Walmart and or even with my sister and I'll just start break down and cry. Even with my friends and my friends understand, but some people, they can't 
they can't understand why it ha- why I'm doing why it's happening to me. But they don't understand when you lose a child so brutally, you change your whole thing, your whole system, your mind, everything changes. Monica told me she feels sharing her story has helped. I wanted to do this with you long ago. And I'm so happy that I got the chance to be able to sit here, not be right in the same room with you, but to be there to talk to you and be able to express, you know, what I'm going through. There is one very special person who brings Craig's memory to life like no one else can. That is his son, Blake. Oh, my God, he's like his double. Oh, I'm, there's pictures of Craig, and I can see Blake, I, you know, and I can see Craig and Blake. And then the hockey, he's so into the hockey like Craig was, and he can't stay still like Craig. Craig could never stand still. He always had to be doing something. Monica cherishes every moment she gets to spend with her grandson, but it breaks her heart that Blake will never know his father. Oh, he knows that he's in heaven. He's not here to see him. How to see how beautiful a, kid, a child he has become. You know, he's so mannerly and beautiful. And to watch him play hockey, like Craig is missing all this. That's the only hurt. Thank you for joining me and listening to Mr. Kellaway's story. If this is the first case you've heard on Crime Beat, please go back and listen to the previous episodes. Crime Beat is written and produced by me, Nancy Hickst, with producer Dila Velasquez. Audio editing and sound design is by Rob Johnston. Special thanks to photographer editor Danny Lantella for his work on this episode. And thanks to Chris Bassett, the National Director of Content and Editorial Standards for Global News. I would love to have you tell a friend about this podcast, and you can help me share these important stories by rating and reviewing Crime Beat on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can find me on Twitter at Nancy Hickst, on Facebook at Nancy Hickst Crime Beat, and I'd love to have you join me for added content on Instagram at nancy.hickst. That's H-I-X-T. Thanks again for listening. Please join me next time. <laughs>